thank you, Michael, for the intro. Now everyone knows my full resume of experience. Um, and what I'm here to talk to you about today is knowledge in companies and how to mine that knowledge to find interesting things. Oops. All right, so let's get started. So how do you find information at a company? It's a pretty big problem. Information is super segmented in Slack, in emails, conversations that people have in the kitchen, getting water. Um, and when someone's new, they don't always know where all that information lies within an organization. Because ultimately, that organization really lies within the people. So to introduce myself, I'm Eva. I work at Sentry.io, which is an open source error monitoring and crash reporting tool for developers. It's been open source for about 10 years, a company for about three to four years. You already know a lot about my background, um, so I'm not gonna get into it too much. Um, I guess the only relevant thing to know is that the work for this project came out of my master's program um, for a social network analysis a class that I took that was also published in a journal in the Netherlands. And one quick fun fact about Sentry, if anyone here um, is a Flask enthusiast, one of our engineers is the Flask founder. So now we can get into it. Identifying intra-organizational knowledge holders using uh, data from Slack. So that's our data source. And all of the code is on this GitHub repo, and I'm going to tweet that out after this. So at Sentry, we use Slack a lot. We have remote teams, so we're even more dependent on using Slack. And sometimes we have technical conversations, like people are trying to debug something together. We're always updating our docs, creating new SDKs. These are things that people have to use Slack for when they're working. Um, in different time zones. But we also use Slack generally and um, more <laughs> for conversations around what to have for lunch, who's leaving their stuff around. And so the analysis that we're going to be performing today is looking at all of these Slack messages to understand who, who's talking about what and who are having these meaningful conversations that we can be using to identify these people are holding special knowledge for this particular organization. And we need to do a quick overview of social network analysis before we can dive in. Has anyone here um, done this form of analysis before? Like a show of hands? OK, cool. So this would be great. So social network analysis is a data visualization technique that maps relationships between things. So it can be two individuals connected via conversation. Maybe they know each other. It can be a mapping of the English Premier League and looking at different soccer teams and football teams and which ones play each other. It can be countries. It can be anything. It's a node, a node, and the connection point between those two nodes. And a network is how all of those interactions lay out in a diagram. And so in terms of defining what is a network, um, network closure is, that, is this entire thing. So this entire thing is a network. If we were going to pull pieces of it apart, that like bulbous round kaleidoscope image, that by itself is a network. Those four points that are all connected to each other, that is a network. That little V offshooting from the center by itself would not be a network. So one important thing about a network is that you have to have some form of closure. In that, in order to do this form of analysis, you must have a complete data set. So you're able to look at a social network analysis for English Premier League soccer because you know that all teams are going to be represented in the data set. Similarly, you can do it for the analysis that I did looking at a company because you know that all employees are in the data set. So you must have a complete data set, very important. Centrality or central nodes are pretty much the nodes with the highest connection points. Those for this form of analysis are the most interesting nodes to look into. And 
what happens if you have an incomplete data set, like I mentioned before, you'll have from just potentially one data point missing from your data set could have a very, very different model that you graph. So now that we've covered the basics of a social network analysis, we're gonna look at how that, that can help us solve our problem of finding intra-organizational knowledge holders. So we can do this. We have a complete network. We can map people as nodes and we can map conversations as network connectors. So we're good to go. Uh, so today we're gonna be starting off by doing an exploratory analysis of our data set, building some network graphs, moving into the next part, which is the natural language processing part, which is question detection and classification, looking at those individual messages being sent. And then we're gonna use part one and part two for part three, which is finding influencers. So the data for this analysis was, is from a company called Citalia, which is an applied artificial intelligence startup based in London, which is where I did this analysis. Um, the only reason why the AI part of this business is important is because when we move into the NLP part, we're gonna be wanting to look for some AI-related terms um, to understand what people are talking about. And we had almost 400,000 messages, uh, around 270 users and six months of conversations, and we only looked at one-to-one -one messages. We didn't look at group messages because when you're doing network analysis, um, each conversational group could be a network and it gets a little confusing. So one-to-one -one conversations um, made it so we could do people and conversations more, more clearly. And this is an overview of the different types of analysis that we're gonna be getting into. So let's explore our data. The data looks like this. Um, we had to first understand what we actually needed to know. Um, timestamp turned out to be interesting. We learned very quickly that we needed to use user ID instead of username, even though username is a bit more interesting because the username changes and the user ID doesn't. Um, so to make it accurate, you must explore kind of things like this in your data. Yes, knowing and cleaning your data is very important. These were the libraries that were used. They're pretty common libraries for any type of um, data science in um, Python. Are people here like, familiar with using these libraries? Figured as such. And these are the ones specific for the data visualization. So matplotlib, I'm sure you all know, is for kind of graphing things in histograms, and network X is very specific for social network analysis, making those diagrams. So the first question is how many people are collaborating with each other? So we plop it all in. We want to look at the centrality. We can't understand it based on this. We have to graph it. Um, we look at it like this, and we can understand that the distribution follows the power law. So we have a lot of people talking to a few people and a few people talking to a lot of people. So who are those few people talking to a lot of people? We seem to have one central node talking to a lot of people. So that's the first node that we really want to investigate. And turns out that that node is a Trello bot. <laughs> And so we have, a whole, we have a whole chunk of our data set of people who are only talking to the Trello bot. So we're gonna remove the Trello bot, and just by moving that one node, we're removing all of those other people from our data set just by default. So this goes into the data cleaning part, which isn't the fun part, but it generally takes up about 80% of the time, and that's the Unfortunate truth when you have data that hasn't been cleaned. So we have all these messages, and what is everybody talking about in these messages? That's the first thing that we really want to understand. So we make a word cloud, and the first thing that pops out is that none of these words really tell us anything. These are the top 100 words in the data set. So we have donut is one of the most popular words, we 
have what looks like some emojis going on. Um, so generally not very helpful. We need to dig a little bit deeper. And that's why we build a question classification model. So for this model, we start by taking an individual message. And we are going to be running this message per message. We put it in the model. And that model is coded to decide, is this a question or is this not a question? And the reason why we want to look at questions is as we want to look at who's asking questions to who and who's answering those questions to understand who's giving useful advice and information and helping people in their work. So it's not, it's not just going to be questions. It's also going to be technical questions, but we'll get there. So question, not question. Both of these are binary results. We move into the content model to understand, is this a business question? Is this like, I need to help with this thing that I'm doing? Or is this, how was your weekend? Um, and then from there, we're going to do a satisfaction and time to reply analysis to find the influencers. So let's get into the first part of building our question detection model. And we want to know who is receiving questions from who um, to find those special people. So we got to tokenize our data. We're going to use regex for that and define a set of rules for question classification. So the first, this doesn't have to do with questions, but we first have to define that the message needs to be in English. There was a bunch of data in the data set that was in like Russian, and it was really throwing everything off. So that's the first rule that needed to be defined. Um, second is a question mark at the end of a phrase pretty sure that when there's a question mark at the end of a phrase, you know that it's a question. Next is a question word. So what, when, where, how, why. We can be pretty sure that that's a question. Um, but lastly is a consecutive bigram, which I'll get into in the next slide. And a consecutive bigram is to handle those situations where people aren't using proper punctuation. They're not really spelling things out. It's very hard to know just on a question mark or a question word that this is actually a question. So we're building any set of rules to handle those exceptions. And this has to do with a start word and then a second word. So could you, had he, are they, does it? Those are all words that, when put together, imply a question and don't need a question word and don't need a question mark. So we're including these in our NLP model. And now we're going to look at how adding this layer of NLP into our diagram affects who's talking to who. It still follows the power law. So when we're looking just at question and answer and not at all conversations, we still have a lot of people talking to a few and a few to a lot. But it's a bit more normalized than what we saw in the beginning. Um, and when we put it in the diagram, it looks a lot better for a network diagram that we can actually investigate. And ultimately, around 13% of messages in the data set were questions and 63% of employees were involved in question and answer. So for the rest of this analysis, we're only going to be looking at those 63% of employees and those 13% of messages. So what is everyone asking about? What are all these 14% of messages that are questions? And we lumped them into categories and saw that there were basically three types of questions that were being asked, the most interesting for us being help-seeking questions. And ironically, um, one of the most popular ones was about getting an error, which is something that Sentry helps. So if only I could have told them earlier about Sentry. Um, so now that we know this, let's analyze our messages to see if they're work-related or if they're more casual. And we need to define some conditions because of the mass of our data. And so we're going to be looking at the length of the question and also the response time. Um, if I ask a question and someone responds four days later, um, my question probably wasn't that urgent to them, or maybe they were on vacation. 
Um, so those are the edge cases that we want to remove from the analysis. And then we build this very interesting model. So there is two rounds to this type of uh, context-based question detection. The first is based on defining keywords. Um, so if a message is a question, which we decide in part one of the model, and if it has a technical keyword, which are predefined keywords, we can just say, yes, this classifies as a technical question. So this goes back to that binary diagram that I had in the beginning. Um, but that first round of analysis isn't really going to capture everything that we need to know. We need to go one step deeper to be able to find what we're looking for. And this is why we use an unsupervised learning technique, which is basically learning from the keywords and learning from the first round and applying it to the second round. So we're tokenizing our messages and we're only going to be using those tokens. We're not going to be looking at the whole messages. I mean, we're basically just going to be looking at all of those words and those keywords and apply all of those keywords in each message to something called bag of words matching. So here's one example of doing a bag of words matching technique. I find it cool. Um, it's a natural language processing technique where you take, so in this example, we're taking two stories of stars who've lost their partners and gone to the single life. And there, there's different words in these stories, but there's a similar message. And we're going to do bag of words matching. And what we find here is that we have some similar words. So the whole, the whole point of this is we're taking story A and we're taking story B and we're pulling out the words that are most frequently used in each of these stories. So in both stories, we have stars, single, triple. That's what's the common denominator between these two stories. So this technique, we're going to apply to our 63% of people's conversations of question and answer that we're using. Next, we're going to put it into this T-SNE data visualization, which is an object-oriented grouping technique to group all of these keywords together that are popular among all of these messages. And one fun fact about T-SNE is that it's way better in Python, though you can also do it in R. So what I should have mentioned in the beginning is that actually social network analysis started pretty much in R, like R was the main language. Um, to use for this, and thanks to Network X and some other libraries, people started doing it in Python, and I just think, Python does it better. Um, and this is the output of our TSNE plot. So what it did is it took all of those most common words from the bag of word matching, and then used a clustering technique to cluster words that were similar to each other. So based on, and this is just a fraction of the cloud that we had created. And so based on this, we were able to basically grab the areas that had keywords that were interesting for us. So we have right here API, routing, optimization, data, version. That area of our diagram definitely implies this is a technical message. It's an AI-based company. It makes sense. Some of these other ones, like the the um, company names like that, we don't need as much. So when we look at the word cloud after doing this bag of words TSNE analysis, we actually get the top 100 words being quite interesting. So these words do imply a technical message. And so we're going to be using these words to define technical keywords to look at our messages and say this message is a technical question. So now that we have this list of technical keywords, we're going to be using them to score each message to build a tech score to decide if it's technical or not. And basically, point two was a threshold that we created. We built a point system, and it was a little bit hacked, but it worked. <laughs> And we were able to find, OK, these are the messages that have the highest number of these technical keywords. And these are questions. So we know that these are like the golden technical questions we were looking for. And ultimately, about half of the questions in the data set were technical questions, 
which I think bodes quite well for this organization's use of Slack. And this is the new network diagram. So it's shrunk pretty considerably. Um, it's quite dense in that middle area. So my hypothesis right now is that that middle area is people who are like really in it on Slack with helping each other. And ultimately, 7% of all the messages on Slack are technical questions. So now that we've done all of this analysis, we can use it to actually find those influential people. And like I mentioned before, it does matter if someone takes a long time to respond to these questions as well. So we'll take a look at that. The average response time is 19 hours. So that implies a lot of outliers in the data. That's the first thing that we want to look at. And since removing outliers also removes questions that might be actually interesting for us to look at, we used weighted averages um, to kind of even out those ratios. So then we apply this all together and we look at which users are receiving technical questions from the most people. So this is, I and I have been at this company for a long time and a lot of people are asking me questions. And at the bottom, these are the usernames um, of those people who received those questions. And then when we look at it from another angle, we also wanna know who's receiving the most questions. So I might be receiving questions from a lot of different people, but those people aren't necessarily asking me a lot of questions. There might be someone else who's receiving a ton of questions from a smaller group of people, but those are both interesting. So these usernames boxed out in blue are the usernames that kept coming up when looking at all different kinds of angles of who's asking them things. And ultimately, we were able to find 10 out of those top 20 usernames in that dense part of the network diagram that kept coming up. So we can be pretty sure that those people are special to this organization. So then again, it's one thing to be asked a lot of questions or asked questions from a lot of people, and it's another to respond well. So it's one, you could just say like, oh, I don't know, ask someone else. Um, and based on the diagram that we had built, that would give that person a lot of points. So that's something we wanted to take into account too. And based on that, defined gratitude terms, such as, thanks, great, awesome, I got it, um, to, to basically define closure to that question. So we do the satisfaction analysis, which had to be, we also had to look at timestamp for that. Um, and make sure that it was the same usernames matched up in this analysis and then found that it was actually the same people that kept coming up that also came up for this. So in conclusion, we started with 268 people. We looked at the network diagram, we removed outliers, we, uh, we looked at the question detection model, we decided what was a question, we decided what was a technical question, we applied those both together, and we found these 10 people kept coming up. So who are these 10 people? Um, what was really interesting to me is that only one of them was in the C-suite. So that person being in the C-suite, like that just naturally carries knowledge about the organization and people naturally ask that person questions. There was also a business development person and a lot of software engineers that were just software engineers, no extra fancy title, and those people kept coming up. And what was really interesting to me about that is that in the companies that we work for, like, we do matter, like everybody matters, and everybody has the ability to like help each other, um, even if they aren't necessarily senior or have been there for a while. And if you're trying this at home, a few things to remember, use a complete network before using any kind of network analysis. Clean and explore your data, make sure that it's actually good data, or else you're just making a garbage algorithm from garbage data, and experiment with different things. And um, the part of this that I think is most cool is the bag of words matching, and that came from some experimenting. Um, so yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, and as an 
overview. These were the libraries and techniques that we used. And here is the long link to GitHub that you're probably not going to write down. So I'll tweet it in case anybody's interested in checking out the actual code for this project. No, thank you. And here's my Twitter, which I'll also um, accept questions on. OK. Can you hear me? Great. So any questions? I'll be the person who came in there. Hey, hi. So I had a question about uh, the satisfaction of mm -hmm. detection in the responses. Yeah, um, I'll go back you know, to that. Yeah. So, you know, it, it seems like you look for words that are like, hey, thank you, or anything like gratitude. Um, did you notice anything of, like, for example, if somebody asked me a question and I say, hey, I don't know, can you ask so-and-so? And, you know, sometimes a person says thank you for that, too. Did you notice anything like that when you were looking at these uh, gratitude responses? Yeah, this is something that I actually thought about recently because <laughs> when we did this analysis and we did the satisfaction analysis, we were like, oh, cool, those people like did respond really well. Um, and then realized actually once I started talking about this that, that actually is a limitation of this analysis that someone could respond with like a thumbs up to also someone that gave a really not helpful answer. Um, so that, yeah, that is. Totally true. We would need to find another way to figure out um, how to actually dive into that. Oh, there. Uh, thank you for the talk. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really cool analysis. Um, I have three questions, so I'll try to make short. Okay. Um, how long did this project or data analysis part take? Um, and then what was, like, the biggest hurdle, maybe, like, in terms of, like, hardest area to solve is the modeling and then how did you um, figure out the what is a technical question versus not so, sure yeah. so okay so the first one was how long did this project take we started in I think February or March and finished in about June just was a bit of time the um, second question was the hardest and the longest part was definitely the natural language processing part. So the social network analysis part, with when you're using libraries, um, you kind of just plop in your data points. And you have to change, right, like the, the nodes, numbers, and like the leafs, and all of these different things to make your diagram work. But the social network analysis part actually was quite quick. It was the NLP that was really complicated, and just certain things like running into questions in Russian. Seems like a really a kind of obvious thing to say, oh, of course, we're only going to be looking at conversations in English. But when you have almost 360,000 messages, you can't read through all of them. You need to really build programs to be able to read them. And um, when your program is getting messed up because of another language, like those are just kind of hurdles that make the process just a little bit longer than you would because you don't really know what's in the data when you start. I um, mean, we started off trying to do a supervised learning model um, and like label a bunch of our data. And it just took so long. And we probably could have used something like Mechanical Turk to label some of the data. But we ended up using the unsupervised approach with like the bag of words and the TSNI because just human error. Um, you had a third question. Yeah, the, that was the technical keywords. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Hi, uh, this is a really interesting uh, project, and I want to try it at home. But then I realized, like, do you need special permission to get the, people's uh, private messages? Yes. So we had to sign a non-disclosure agreement with the company that offered us this data. Um, and able to, to be able to use it for this project. They also were like, interested in the results of it. So they were like, yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> we did it inside an NDA. Um, you can use public chat room data to do a similar type of analysis. Um, so any kind of, like if you wanted to use a Reddit group, 
that's all public and you can do social network analysis on a Reddit group because it's a group. So if the group has 18 members, you know that it has 18 members. It's not like an, a fan base, right? If you wanted to do a fan base for a band, um, you can't really as easily because it's not a confined group. Um, does that answer your question? But yeah, huh. any kind of public, public data is great for this also. Hi, uh, you mentioned how important it is to clean the data that you're using before you plug it into all your systems. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering how manual a process that was to clean the data and at what point you, or how you were able to confidently know when you were done cleaning it and the data set that you had was actually worthy. Yeah, it was, the data cleaning was a bit of a process throughout. Um, so, we cleaned it, we were like, okay, this seems good. Like we're kind of like visualizing different things. There doesn't appear to be any outliers. Um, and then you do something else and you're like, oh, okay, the average time to reply is 19 hours and we've already done so much work. So the, yeah, the cleaning process is pretty continuous throughout, like especially when you're using data that someone just hands you that they've downloaded from something. You, there's a lot of weird stuff in there. Um, and you're never really ever done. Um, and so it's just, it's just, I guess, a question of what accuracy are you trying to reach and how are you measuring that accuracy and if you feel like you're creating results that are accurate. Okay, that's it. We're out of time. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for a great presentation.